<laughs> it's okay, Kitty. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's just a fart. Or you just passed gas. But it's surely very funny. <laughs> oh, come back, Kitty. We won't make fun of you anymore. Hey, friends. I'm sure a lot of us must have faced such moments when we passed gas in front of others. But the fact is, we all fart. Some are silent, some are loud, whereas some are as noisy as an atomic bomb. So, today let us enter into the stinky winky world of gas and try to answer the awkward question, why do we fart? Zoom in! So, what is a fart? Fart, as we popularly know, is also known as flatulence. It is interstinal gas that we pass every day, almost 10 to 20 times to be more specific. But where does this gas come from? Well, there are multiple sources of it. A tiny proportion comes from swallowing air while we are sleeping. Whereas, some portion enters our body while eating. Yes, when we eat, we are not only consuming food, but also giving the gas like nitrogen and oxygen a free pass to enter our body and into our stomach. These gases then build up over there and ultimately have to find a way to get out. So, some of them go upward and comes out in the form of a burp. Whereas, the mischievous ones go down and come out in the form of a fart. But the most stinky question is, why does the fart smell so bad? Well, blame the bacteria for that. Our intestines are home to trillions of bacteria living without giving any rent. But they are essential as they help us to break down our food. This process releases gases such as nitrogen, carbon dioxide, hydrogen and methane. But all of them are odorless. So who is the real culprit for making us suffocate? Well, it's the sulfur compounds such as hydrogen sulfide, methanethiol and ammonia that gives the gas that infamous stinky smell. But why are some silent and some loud? Well, it all depends upon how relaxed your muscles are. In a relaxed condition, you are most likely to pass the silent fart that often stinks pretty badly but also saves you from the embarrassment as you blame the neighbor for the fart attack. But at times, when you try to hold the gas for a long time, the gas builds up and the sudden shooting causes vibration that makes it sound really loud, which usually do not smell as bad as the silent one. But unfortunately, could not save you from the moment of embarrassment. So, what do you have to do to be less farty and stinky? Well, one way is to try cutting down on foods like beans, onions and fried foods as these items release massive amounts of gas during the process of breaking down the food. And if you find yourself farting more than usual after you eat ice cream, yogurt or milk, it is more likely that your body may have a difficult time digesting the natural sugar called lactose, which is found in dairy foods. So, it's better to talk to your parents and doctor about it. And don't forget that farting can sometimes be a body sign that it's time to take a trip to the bathroom. It's trivia time! Did you know the word fart was coined in the year 1632 
and comes from the old English word futin, meaning to break wind. Also, did you know that the most prolific farters in the animal kingdom are termites? Yes, due to a heavy diet of wood, termites eject ungodly volumes of gas. It is estimated that they are responsible for 11% of global methane emissions. That's more than every car on the planet. The second spot goes to camels and zebras stand proudly on the third spot. Hope you enjoyed today's episode and remember, even though a fart is a normal natural phenomenon, it's not polite to fart in social settings like in a class or at the dinner table. But don't worry if this happens accidentally, just remember to say, excuse me. Until next time, it's me, Dr. Binox, zooming out. Ah. Uh. Never mind. Mm. <laughs>
and I just can't stop sweating. I'm so drenched in sweat that there is no need to take a bath today. <laughs> just kidding. Oh, by the way, friends, have you ever wondered why you get soaked in water after playing or wrestling with your sibling for a large piece of cake? Hmm. Well, today let us learn why and how this salty fluid suddenly emerges from our skin and what exactly is its purpose. Zoom in! Sweat has a bad reputation in our minds due to its stinky and sticky nature. But trust me friends, sweating plays a vital role in maintaining our body's temperature and keeping us healthy. Sweating can happen in response to various situations like eating hot and spicy food, nervousness, when we fall sick or by merely wearing a sweater in summer. But physical activities like running or playing is the most common cause of sweating and is triggered by sweat glands under the surface of the skin. The sweat gland is a long, coiled, hollow tube of cells. The coiled part in the dermis is where sweat is generated and the long part is a pipe that connects the gland to the opening or pore on the skin's outer surface. But why do we sweat? Well, sweating helps in the process called... Mm, uh, uh, mm. Now, what's it called? Yes, sweating helps in the process called thermoregulation. Thermoregulation is the ability of an organism to keep its body temperature within certain boundaries in different surroundings. In simple words, when we get hot, sensors in the body tell the brain. The brain then directs the nervous system to send signals to sweat glands that are present all over the body to start working and produce sweat. The sweat is water containing sodium and chloride. As water is an excellent heat absorbent, it absorbs much of our body's heat and evaporates it, which in turn cools you down a bit. Trivia time! Did you know that everyone has between 2 and 5 million sweat glands spread across the body? And most of them are situated on your palms of your hands, the soles of your feet and on your head. So here we go friends. Next time, when you play longer than usual without feeling much exhausted, you can thank the sweat for keeping you cool. See you next time with more fun facts. It's me, Dr. Binox, zooming out. Oh. Oh. Take a deep breath. <sighs> oh. Hello friends, you are already here. Thanks for visiting and waiting until I finished my meditation. I often meditate to feel better, think clearly and most importantly, to keep my emotions in check, especially anger. Yes, my friends, anger is a complex emotion we all struggle to deal with. But have you ever wondered why do we get angry? If not, then don't you worry my friends, because in today's episode, let us explore this turbulent emotion we call anger and answer the question, why do we get angry? Zoom in! So friends, have you ever got so angry that you felt like screaming or throwing something away just because things didn't go your way? Maybe your sibling ate your cake, or your friend lost the book he took from you, or the last season of your favorite series failed to live up to your expectation. Well, the fact is, we all get angry. It is just one of the many emotions we feel daily, like happiness, sadness, fear, etc. 
Although you are totally aware of how angle looks like from outside, let me show you what's happening inside your body while you're fuming over a certain issue. Imagine you are happily walking on the street, dressed neatly to go to your friend's birthday party. When suddenly, a car swiftly cuts you off and splashes slimy mud on your favorite dress, which ultimately turns you from a peace-loving creature into an incredible Hulk. As you get angry and go into the smash mode, changes begin to happen in your body starting with your amygdala, a part of your brain that deals with emotions. Yes, the amygdala gets activated and releases a chemical known as catecholamine that causes you to react with a burst of energy and prepares you for some physical activity. Also, hormones known as epinephrine, aka adrenaline, and norepinephrine are released into the body that raises your heart rate and blood pressure, turning you red and making you ready for some action. But fortunately, another part of your brain called prefrontal cortex responsible for making judgment also gets activated, thus making sure you don't react illogically to the situation and stopping you from taking aggressive steps towards others. Also, it's vital to know that constant chronic anger can significantly increase your chances of getting heart diseases like high blood pressure, heart attack or even a stroke. Although it's completely okay to be mad at times, it's essential that anger must be released in the right way. So, make sure that you don't always react in the heat of the moment by trying to keep your emotions in check and adopt a healthy lifestyle like doing meditation or exercising. And it's a good idea to talk about your anger with an adult such as a parent or teacher. Once you talk about anger, you will realize that those bad feelings usually start to go away. Trivia time! Did you know anger can cause memory lapse? Yes, chemicals associated with anger can destroy neurons in the hippocampus and prevent the growth of new neurons resulting in weakening of the memory faculties of the brain. Also, the impact of anger on the heart may be more severe for women than for men. A study showed that completing a stressful task such as explaining something that made an individual angry caused a greater reduction in blood flow to the hearts of female participants. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Until next time, it's me Dr. Binox zooming out. Ah, uh, never mind. Oh, what happened? Oh, you meant you passed the test. Congratulations on it. But for a moment, I felt like someone screamed that you passed out or fainted. Fainted? Yes, little kitty. Fainting is pretty common amongst humans. Hey friends, so in today's episode, let me explain this biological phenomenon by answering a head-turning question. Why do we faint? Zoom in! I'm sure most of us must have seen scenes from movies where people faint after hearing some bad news or smelling dirty socks. Even in day-to-day -day life, we often find people passing out due to lack of food or poor health. But what exactly is happening to their bodies during such a moment? Well, to know that, first we need to understand what exactly is fainting. Fainting, medically known as syncope, 
is a temporary loss of consciousness. It happens because our brain stops receiving enough oxygen-rich blood to continue its daily activities and loses the normal state of being awake and understanding what is happening around us. Now, there are multiple factors behind this loss of consciousness, but the most common reason is a drop in blood pressure due to a strong vasovagal response often triggered by a reaction to something that shocks us. This reflex is named after the vagus nerve which runs from your brain to your heart, lungs and digestive tract. The job of the vagus nerve is to stabilize the blood pressure when we are shocked or frightened, which leads to an increase in heart rate shooting up the blood pressure. But sometimes these nerves malfunction and reduce the blood pressure more than normal, leading to a lack of blood supply to our brain, resulting in a brief loss of consciousness or fainting. Besides reacting to the sight of something that scares you or having an intense emotional reaction, some other triggers can also cause a vasovagal syncope, which includes getting overheated, standing for a long time, intense physical activity, etc. So, it's vital to know the early signs of fainting to avoid making things worse. And what are these signs? Well, if someone is about to faint, they will show symptoms such as dizziness, lightheadedness, paleness, vision changes, fast or irregular heartbeat, sweating and vomiting. And when that happens, immediately stop doing whatever you are involved in and if possible, lie down on the floor. This can help prevent a fainting attack, letting blood get to the brain. And once you feel better, please stand up slowly. But to prevent fainting in the first place, make sure to keep yourself hydrated by drinking plenty of water throughout the day. Also, it's vital to keep your blood circulating by moving around whenever possible playing outside, doing regular exercise and avoiding sitting in one place for a longer period. And whenever you feel anxious, slowly breathe into a paper bag to stabilize the emotions and blood pressure. Remember my friends, if you've only fainted once, it was brief and the reasons are obvious, then there's usually no need to worry about it. But if it happens regularly, then it's crucial to make an appointment with your doctor. Trivia time! Did you know, compared to younger adults, syncope occurs up to twice as often in adults older than 70 and up to four times as often in adults over the age of 80. Also, syncope accounts for 2 to 6% of emergency room visits and 4% of hospital admissions every year. Hope you learned something new today. Until next time, it's me, Dr. Binox, zooming out. Never mind. <laughs>
at some point of time in life. It is also known as ice cream headache or sphenophallotin ganglion neuralgia, which means pain in the nerves in your face, the roof of your mouth and around your sinuses. Gosh, don't know about the brain freeze, but that name will surely give a headache to many. <laughs> so, coming back to the most important question. Why do we get it? Does our brain hate to eat ice cream or other cold stuff? Well, I'm sure it does not because there is a neurological reason behind the shocking phenomenon. So, let us see what that is. Well, imagine you open the refrigerator and you see a divine scoop of ice cream right in front of you waiting to be eaten by you and only you. But suddenly, you hear your sibling marching down the staircase and you yank the ice cream and quickly eat a spoonful of it faster than the speed of light. When suddenly, everything around your face and head starts to feel squeezed as your brain gets frozen for a moment and you get a brain freeze. But why is that? That's because when you sip an icy drink or consume ice cream super fast, the temperature in the back of your throat drops rapidly that has two essential nerves behind it. The first is the internal carotid artery which feeds blood to the brain and the other is the anterior cerebral artery which is where the brain tissue starts. And one thing your brain doesn't appreciate much is a sudden change in the temperature. And when the cold hits, it causes expansion and contraction of these arteries, causing a sudden change in the blood flow. And that's the sensation that the brain interprets as a type of pain we call brain freeze. So, now you know the reason behind that headache that comes and goes, that comes and goes. <laughs> Oops, sorry. But the question remains, how do we avoid getting these headaches and what we should do when it occurs? Well, there are two ways to deal with it. First is the easy way and the other is the most difficult thing to apply. The easier method is you can push your tongue up to the roof of your mouth because it can help to normalize the temperature in your mouth. And the difficult thing is to stop eating ice cream and other cold stuff at all. Which I think isn't really necessary because brain freeze isn't deadly and it goes away as quickly as it comes. So go ahead and enjoy that ice cream. Trivia time! Did you know brain freeze is one of the most common types of headaches experienced? Yes, it affects between 5.9% and 74% of adults and around 79% of children. Also, some research shows that people who experience brain freeze also tend to experience migraines. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Until next time, it's me, Dr. Binox, zooming out. Oh, never mind. <laughs>